Watercolor pigments come from a variety of sources. We have organic matter, um, minerals, and uh, we also see uh, chemical or synthetic properties uh, in modern watercolor paints as well. In fact, in order to make watercolor paint, uh, Daniel Smith, for example, employs a team of chemists who uh, are developing uh, new pigments and figuring out the best way to get um, just the most beautiful effects with the pigments they're working with. And as an artist, uh, I'm not so much about the science, but how I can use the different properties of watercolor pigment to create unique and beautiful watercolor effects. And when I say unique, I mean totally unique. And I want to demonstrate that today with the goal of giving you some tools you can come away with to help you exercise some different strategies for working with your watercolor pigment and seeing your own beautiful and unique watercolor effects. I want to start by just taking a look at a few <laughs> minerals I have here on my desk. Um, here I have uh, three different um, mineral um, different rocks, um, different colored rocks, and they're really quite beautiful just on their own. But uh, these are uh, some of the minerals that you might see in the names of your watercolor paint. This one is serpentine, and that makes me think of Daniel Smith's color Serpentine Genuine. Um, this one here is Fuchsite, and uh, this one is Sodalite, and Sodalite Genuine is one of my favorite pigments. Uh, for watercolor as well. Daniel Smith has a Primatech line which is mineral inspired and so uh, portions of these different minerals are found in those pigments that bear their names. What makes these minerals uh, unique and different is the fact that when you're working with uh, minerals they have different weights, different uh, particle sizes, and different specific gravity. And all of this will affect the way they move across your paper. And today as we paint, uh, we'll be looking at the way some of those different mineral properties affect the paint. And it's not just minerals. Uh, Dye-based organic pigments are going to have different properties as well. Every time you work with a particular paint color, you begin to develop strategies for working with that color. And that's really what I want to focus on and talk about today. Whether you're working with a single color or mixing color, um, you can have a lot of fun and a lot of variety in what you get out of that color depending on some of the strategies you use. So we're going to start with just a rather dry brush and uh, this uh, color here which is called Magic Wizard and it's made by Rockwell Watercolors. That's a Canadian company that I've been recently using and uh, loving the variety of mineral pigments that I really haven't seen these colors anywhere else, these combinations of pigments. And with my damp brush, I'm just going to work at the, this and loosen up the top surface of the paint until I get a nice uh, thick saturation of pigment on my brush. And what I see with a lot of beginning painters is we tend to work with all our pigments the same way. We get the same ratio or we try for the same ratio of water and pigment and we work with a rather controlled amount of pigment on the page. You can see that color going down is kind of a rich reddish brown. Uh, I have enough water on um, mixed with that to give me a nice thick saturation and that color goes down and we get that lovely kind of burgundy color. And this is a great way to get rich color and consistent color. Anytime I want to fill a, con a consistent area of a space with a solid wash of color, I'm going to work with this kind of control. But many of these colors, the the, pig, the mixed pigments or the colors you mix yourself um, start to create some really beautiful effects when we start to Im invite a little more movement into our painting. And so I'm going to just take that same rich saturation, the Magic Wizard, and we're going to start to draw it out with a little bit of water and just dilute it a bit and see what that teaches us about the color. Even if you're a new painter, you've been taught that dilute, adding water lightens a color it dilutes it, you can get back to just the palest tint of a, of a hue. And you can see that as I start to draw down this wash of color, I start to see the color change. And just pull that down a little bit. One thing that we're seeing as this starts to dry is actually a change in the color. It almost seems like a change in the color temperature. We go from kind of a reddish brown to something that's a little more yellow and then this pale tan at the bottom. We're also seeing uh, the transparency that we bring when we add water gives us a look at this particular color's texture. 
and the different sedimentary properties of this pigment. And when you're working with a mineral-based pigment, or any color that has a combination of different pigments, you're going to see uh, some of those heavier pigments settling into the texture of your paper. And that's where we get uh, granulation or sedimentary color. A color that starts has that heavier weight and it really likes to find the lowest place on the paper. Uh, just like if you were a gold miner um, and you're sluicing out um, rock and, and uh, your, your dirt and rock to get the gold, Gold being heavier, it sinks to the bottom of the sluice. We've been watching a lot of gold mining uh, reality shows lately, I guess you can tell. Um, but the reason that gold mining works is because the gold sinks to the bottom. And we see that with some of these heavier sedimentary colors as well. These mineral-based pigments are often a little heavier than maybe the other pigment, um, or just heavy enough that they don't want to flow as readily. And so we get some flow, but we also get to start to see that texture happen. And so here we have a beautiful property of this pigment that you don't see in that thick, um, inky kind of saturation of color. So if you're working with pigment and you're only working with kind of that that richest saturation of that hue, you're gonna miss out on all of this pretty. So do take the time whenever you're learning a new color um, or just playing with uh, washes on your paper, take the time to get to know how a color moves and flows. You might just fall in love with the color that's not that exciting all by itself in that thick, rich saturation. We're gonna use more of the Magic Wizard and I bring it right over here. And this time you're gonna create a little more organic shape. That's just more fun and interesting. With a moist brush, I can get that rich color. And then as the color starts to run out, it gets a little lighter as I draw away from that first brush stroke. And when I'm working with my brush, you know, a brush is a, is a tool in your hand. Often putting that brush stroke on the paper, you're pressing down a little bit. You're actually pushing pigment into those hollows on the paper. And so it does want to settle in and soak into the page a bit. And uh, actually with that said, we should do a version where we're working with um, maybe wet and wet as well. So when I've used my brush to place color, I've been very controlled about how I apply it to the paper. And uh, a little bit of dry brush here has made a lovely organic shape. It doesn't have to look controlled. But another thing that I like to do to, is invite some spontaneity and let the color do what it naturally wants to do. So rather than using my wet brush to pull out a swatch like I did over here, I'm gonna use my spray bottle and encourage movement that doesn't involve me being in control. And this is a really important part of my personal watercolor practice. It's something I really love to do. It teaches me about the pigments that I'm using and their different capabilities. Uh, it helps me to slow down and observe. And it has been probably my favorite aspect of working with watercolor. Letting go of control and noticing how beautiful watercolor is all by itself. Bringing in my spray bottle takes, uh, first of all, I have kind of an irregularity of how much water it was added to the page. You can see that this particular spray bottle, it kind of squirts out droplets of water, not a fine even mist. It has a gentle spray, it's not too, I have, I have one that's much more powerful, um, which will almost provide a jet stream of water. I don't want that. Um, I want a delicate splash of water and I want an irregular um, amount so that I get some areas where there's just a mist of pigment and other areas where I've got some puddles. And here where it misted, I have kind of a yellow green that's kind of happening, but here where it's puddling, it's a reddish brown. Again, the different pigment qualities are coming into the fore here, and I see a little squirrel in this corner. Um, and the texture of the pigment is, is also playing a role. We can see some of that granulation that was happening over here. There's uh, pigment that's sitting deep into the texture of the paper and other pigment that's floating. And because my hand has not been involved, each of those pigments, I haven't dragged them around, I haven't stirred them with my brush, they're naturally going where they want to go, following um, for them whatever happens to be the path of least resistance. 
I'm going to just soften out a little bit of that area right here. Let's use a damp brush to just wet this square over here. Working wet and wet is a great way to learn about pigment qualities as well. Um, you may have noticed when I sprayed this section, the, um, some of the color kind of immediately wanted to um, whoosh out. It had a movement to it. And we're going to see that happen perhaps here as well as we paint wet and wet. There's a little bit of that movement. And some of those staining properties. There's little tendrils of radiant um, color that are kind of a pink here. That shows me what, what aspect of this color, this mixture of pigments, is uh, has that movement to it and has that flow. And as this flows, we're really seeing that granulation naturally happening on the wet paper. One thing you can also look at is as the color starts to settle into the paper and the, the wet wash starts to lose its sheen, it's not quite so shiny, um, try the watermark test. Put some droplets of water right on the, um, sl the slowly drying wash and see what that does to your mineral pigments. Uh, how does that create texture? Is that water smoothly absorbed or does it create watermarks and differences in texture and, and uh, color? Um, do we see some of those edges start to happen? Okay, I have one more thing I want to show you when it comes to working with uh, mineral pigments or any pigments with this density or granulation. And uh, this is a technique to, to work with and have fun with. All of this is designed so that you don't have to be afraid to use a little extra water uh, when you're painting. You know, I've almost always found that when I invite a little bit of surprise into my painting, a little bit of freedom and release, uh, my painting turns out better than if I was uh, having tight control over my brush the entire time. So this time what I want to show you is sometimes a color goes on too dark, sometimes a shape looks too controlled, sometimes I just want a little bit of a reboot. And using your water and spray to rinse away almost everything you've just done can invite something new into the painting as well. And I've just taken my spray bottle, you can see, and let go of all of that, everything. Um, all of that color, the only thing that's left is this yellow shape, um, which is has stained a bit into the paper. But what's happened is as that's moved, and if my paper was larger, um, if I had let it settle in longer, uh, there would be more pigment left behind. Letting gravity and water encourage flow um, can really soften a shape and make it a more gentle part of your painting. And there are times when it feels like a loss to get that spray bottle out. Let's do it again over here as well. To get that spray bottle out and just bring in some of that extreme flow. Um, but when you do, um, some, you know, it brings the opportunity for something new to be left behind. And I want to just, uh, use uh, a damp brush can do the same thing. You can sometimes channel flow just by guiding a damp brush down a section of the paper. Um, it's going to take some of that pigment that's sitting on top and move it with gravity and uh, soften that effect, lighten your passage of that shape, get the value a little bit lighter, and make room for something new to happen. Uh, when I'm working with extra water, I get a lot more softness. All of these shapes here with all of this softness gives me opportunity to build layers and shapes over top. And that's another thing that I learned from working with my spray bottle and letting these, or these different organic or mineral pigments do what they want to do, do what they were made to do and show off their unique properties. One thing I want to mention as well is this particular color, Magic Wizard from Rockwell, is made from two different pigments. And that gives us a clue as to something else you can do um, if you don't happen to have uh, these combined mineral pigments. Uh, you can take the time to look at your own pigment mixtures in your palette. And often when you're mixing color in your palette, uh, you're gonna come back to your dry palette and you're gonna see some really interesting effects here in, 
uh, dried right in the palette. Here I've got a green that I had mixed using a yellow and a teal. Actually, I think I used a bit of that too. You can kind of tell. I haven't cleaned it yet. And as it's dried, it started to separate. That indicates to me that if I were to play with some of these washes of this color, I might start to see some of these effects uh, in my painting as well. Uh, this is a combination of an ultramarine blue and an orange. And as it starts to dry, we get this kind of peachy um, a little bit around the edges. And that also indicates to me that I can get some very unique color properties when I start to let color flow take a little longer to dry that's another key <laughs> this dried a lot faster than these areas here working with less water and the more time something has to dry the more it's going to naturally do what it organically does here in my palette a puddle of paint in the palette takes a long time to dry and the longer your drying time the more interesting those colors tend to be. One way to observe the pigment properties of your color, if you're working with a lot of control and want to take some of the guesswork away, is to pay attention to what your paint water is doing. This water I've just been working with, it's quite fresh. Um, it's a deep red working with this magic wizard hue. But when I dump that color out, I get uh, at the bottom all of this blue pigment just kind of settles down into uh, the bottom of the cup. Maybe it's easier to see that way. And all of that blue pigment, those are the heavier particles. They're not floating in the water, um, turning the water red. They've settled down into the bottom. And when I drain my water, I'm often surprised by the colors that are sitting on the bottom, those heavier pigments. And <laughs> The heavier pigments are going to do interesting things on your paper as well when you let them flow. My hope is that all of these little tips for working with different pigments helps you to be a little more courageous when it comes to working with your own watercolor paint. Letting color flow is a wonderful way to start a painting. Those first layers of uh, planning your painting are often a great time to work with wet and wet color. Uh, to let uh, your shapes be soft and flow into each other. And that creates a wonderful underpainting for the control that you can bring in in your second, third, and successive layers. As you build on top of those first soft shapes, um, you can create uh, the, the definition, <laughs> the hard edges that bring your painting form, uh, while also having some of that beautiful delicate soft flowing color radiating through in those lighter areas and uh, building on top of that also brings you richer color as you build up your layers these are all techniques that i teach in my online classes it's really important to me to encourage artists encourage you as an artist to trust yourself your falling in love with watercolor is something that we want to let live on the page. We want others to see how much we care about this beautiful medium and how much we want to celebrate it. This month I'm celebrating World Watercolor Month and I'd encourage you to celebrate with me uh, not just the beauty of watercolor but your own journey and everything you've accomplished as you've the work to teach yourself how to paint like you. Visit worldwatercolormonth.com to find out more about how you can participate and celebrate World Watercolor Month with us. Thanks for watching. I'm Angela Fair.